Hey, Josh. How's it going to be? <laughs> I'm good. How are you? Um, it, what's it called? It's interesting being on this side of the <laughs> on this side of the fence for the <laughs> first time in a pretty long time. So um, I can imagine. Yeah. Yes, Josh is Mr. Josh Wilcox. Mm. He is a producer. He's been in and around music and media for a very long time, and we met here at Brooklyn Podcasting Studio. Yes, <laughs> this is my studio. <laughs> Yeah, he's just super knowledgeable at what he does, and I was just, like, really impressed by it. And we actually got introduced because of Nadine, who also comes here. Yeah, yeah, what's mm -hmm. it called? Um, I actually, in full disclosure, you helped me out with a uh, transition of making this business officially 100% mine. Awesome. And uh, I really enjoyed the process. You have a great team and Thank something you. that I'm hoping to... Uh, you know, you, you know, I've I've watched you scale and heard some of your stories about how you scaled your business, and mm -hmm. I'm you know I'm trying to uh, take a little bit of that knowledge and apply it here. But um, but yeah, yeah I had a great experience with you and your team. Ah, uh, thanks yeah. so much, Josh. I appreciate that. Yes, Josh is also a client. And <laughs> happy to say, mm -hmm. um, and um, and yeah, so we we started building this relationship. But Josh, you have been in this industry for a very long time. Mm -hmm. How did you get started? Um. <laughs> Honestly, it all happened through like an epiphany that I had on the train. Mm. So like, well, first you kind of mentioned that I started off in music. So yeah. like, yeah, I I had worked in the music industry for a while, um, mostly as an audio engineer. Okay. And then uh, I never stopped being an audio engineer. Obviously, I'm doing it as we're doing a session right now. <laughs> right. <laughs> for people who don't know out there, yes, I am recording myself. <laughs> right. He's, he's multitasking. <laughs> multitasking that, during this right that's now. That's talent. <laughs> um, but um, but yeah, I started off uh, working in music and. Um, you know, I went to school for audio engineering mm -hmm. and, you know, I worked, you know, uh, I worked in a couple of different studios, uh, most notably, like I worked for Jim Jones for a little bit of time in oh, nice. his studio. Um, what was that experience like? Um, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> very, very interesting. I was mm -hmm. just say I learned a lot. OK. Um, I definitely enjoyed a lot of things. There's a lot of things I didn't like. Right. Um, most what I would probably say most notably though, like I got a lot of confidence from that studio, both mm. with the good and the bad. Um, okay. I really learned how to just you know work and put my head down and just work despite the fact there were a lot of distractions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure this was like what. And what what era yeah. was so it? this was kind of like before um, this is like after his you know major hit ball and a few years oh, removed okay few years removed from that um, and I think Dipset had like their little breakup at the time but they were kind of reforming back together and stuff like that okay um, but I spent most of the time I recorded a few of Jim's tracks to be honest with you but oh, I nice. mostly but I mostly but I mostly recorded for his uh, label that now I think is getting ready to restart itself called Bird Gang. Oh, okay. Um, so, like, I ended up recording, like, a lot of those artists and a lot of, like, their early stuff, so. Okay. So yeah. that must have been cool because that was just, like, sort of the height of, of their sort of popularity. Yeah. It, I mean, it was, I mean, I'm not going to lie. It was pretty cool. Like, mm -hmm. the studio, one of the coolest parts about it was, like, the studio, I'm not going to give the I address where or anything right, like right. that, but it was somewhere in Midtown where a lot of other, like, really famous studios are. Okay. And uh, it was on, like, the eighth or ninth floor or something like that. And I liked this perfect view of, like, the uh, the Empire State Building and stuff like that. That's and, dope. like, and you could see, like, the sort of the lights coming off the building and the clouds and stuff like that. So, wow. like, I was working with that as like the backdrop wow um, so did you yeah. feel like it was sort of like dream come true at the time or um initially yes mm -hmm. i mean the funny part is when i got <laughs> so the funny part is i ended up getting that gig mm -hmm. um Largely because this is the only time where I'll say I actually got a gig that got that gig largely because of my degree, actually. Mm, so okay. the school I went to was Full Sail and a Full Sail grad was the main engineer at the studio. And he okay. was looking for help because he was really Jim's main engineer. Mm. And he was like, well, if you've done this before, he's like, if you've gone to the school, I know you know your stuff. Right, so, right. Um, so he was the one that got me in there. And uh, initially I was just like, oh, my God, I, I like when I went into the studio, I didn't know who owned the studio. I didn't okay. know who I would be working for or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I just opened the main control room and there's Jim Jones just sitting there. Oh, wow. And I was like, oh, oh, like, you know, it's one of those things where like you're starstruck for half a second. Yeah. And you're like, you're trying, <laughs> and you're trying to play it off like it's everything's cool. Yeah. Um, you know, got home, obviously was cheesing, told my girlfriend, who's right. now my wife, um, 
you know, about it and everything like that. So, um, so yeah, it was initially kind of like that, but, um, Mm -hmm. like I said, it was, um, there was a lot of good and bad experiences there. (laughs) Um, you know, I felt uh, a little underappreciated, which is ultimately the reason why I left after about a year of being there. But I'll ultimately say though, I, I feel like that was also part, partly on me. I was kind of pretty young okay, and I really didn't know how to like advocate for myself. You know, I, I do think the people that, um, that I ended up recording, especially most of the artists, like they did appreciate me. Mm-hmm. But I think, you know, it's kind of like that phrase, like closed mouths don't get fed. Yeah, so, you you're know, so right and, about you know, that. And uh, they appreciated me. But like when I wanted to get paid, what I felt I would deserve to get paid mm-hmm. or, or, you know, just be treated in a certain manner, you know, it's like mm-hmm. I didn't have the words or the confidence to speak up for myself at yeah. that time. So I love that you bring that up because I definitely have had that experience myself and it's easy to sort of like blame the environment, yeah. blame the people that you're around, you yeah. know, and then, you know, if you have enough foresight to like look inwards and mm-hmm. be like, you know what, I had a part and I could have done X, Y, Z. So I think it's important for people to know, like when you're in situations that either could be opportunities or just always like a growth um, situation to evaluate how you could have done better and then do that the next time exactly because i mean there were there were instances where they where they did come and ask me like is there you know what can we do for you mm. and i still even in that instance there weren't don't get me wrong there weren't many instances where they, <laughs> right. and this was after many months of doing very quality work for them okay. but at the same time like you know when that opportunity arose i think i was a little bit um, for lack of better words, bitter. Mm. And because I was a little bitter that I just didn't even, you know, I didn't even speak up for myself at yeah. that point. So, And there's something to be said about not being able to receive things at a, a certain period of time. Yeah, that's a fact. <laughs> yeah, because I've, I've gone through that as well, like where I know that people have done wonderful things for me. And because it wasn't exactly how I pictured it, you mm-hmm. know, to be, I didn't appreciate it. And so it's like you sort of miss that that opportunity yeah. that, you know, you couldn't receive the love. You couldn't receive what they were trying to do, exactly. even though <laughs> it may not have been in the best package. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't regret it. I mean, I don't mm. regret it because I really am enjoying what I'm doing now. But mm. at the same time, you know, I, I won't lie. If I, I wouldn't I'd be lying if I said that I, at some point in time thought about like, oh, what if I had actually, you know, yeah. Had, had the the foresight and the confidence to be like, yeah, like pay me this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I need these things. <laughs> yes, I feel you on that one. So how how did you decide to go to engineering school? You said you went to one of the best schools for engineering. How did yeah, you decide that? So initially, like uh, I really got into music through DJing. Like I okay. DJed when I was uh, pretty young in high school. And, uh, you know, and I think that was really the gateway for me to uh, try to figure it out. Like I tried to tell my parents who were really supportive, but mm-hmm. like obviously when they hear like, oh, your kid wants to go into music, especially considering like I was a pretty good student. Mm-hmm. I was pretty, you know, I had other things that I had interest in too. Like I was pretty good at uh, writing. I was mm-hmm. also pretty good at science. So like I kind of felt like I could do a whole bunch of different things, but right. I really, when I got into DJing, like I really liked this music thing. So, mm-hmm. um, and I was initially going to go to school to quote unquote be a DJ. Cause like, cause, <laughs> and, or, and we're also talking like maybe, uh, cause I graduated high school in 2004, what, 2004, I think, or something like okay. that. So, mm-hmm. um, at that time, there really were like, you know, now there's DJ schools everywhere and yeah. audio schools everywhere right. and stuff like that. But back then, there really wasn't that many. And um, well, there definitely weren't any that were accredited. So, gotcha. <laughs> so, <laughs> so my sure. parents weren't really too, too keen on me doing that. Um, but um, the other job that I knew that was out there was mm-hmm. like uh, audio engine was audio engineering. And at that time, like my music chops, like I think every audio engineer, like secretly, they want to be a producer. Like everybody, okay. anybody who any any audio engineer that's out there that, right. like, that gets into music, like honestly, like they're all trying to be producers. producers <laughs> they're, okay. all, they're all trying to be producers. Keep it real. <laughs> yeah. But um, so I was like, oh, I'll do that. And mm-hmm. that's kind of what got me into it because I figured like the closest I could my my mindset was the mm-hmm. closer I could be to the music the better uh, the better it is for okay me, so mm-hmm. um, but yeah but that's essentially what got me in the door in the door yeah. okay that's cool so then you had you got you went there you got this cool opportunity to work for mm-hmm. Jim Jones mm-hmm. so what happens next after that so what happens next is. One of the other reasons why I decided I wanted to leave was Mm -hmm. because, like I said, every audio engineer wants to be a secret producer. Mm -hmm. And one of the cool things I got to witness um, was, you know, these producers would come around, like people who I didn't even know, producers, Mm -hmm. some of them I knew. Okay. Um, Like I got to meet one, like uh, I got to meet like a few like relatively famous producers. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, I know who you are. Okay. Um, The general public might not know who you are, but But I I know know who you are. (laughs) But I know who you are. And um, 
And I was, but some of these guys were completely unknown and they would come in with like just gang loads of tracks, like mm. just of great music. And they would play them, what's it called? They would play them for, you know, the artists in the studio and they mm-hmm. would pick beats or whatever. Mm. And sometimes like right there on the spot, like I'd see somebody hand that producer a check for X amount of dollars. Really? And like, and I'm not talking about a small pocket change, even right. like, you know, here's five, ten thousand dollars for this beat or whatever or something like wow. that. Mm. Or, you know, I mean, not all of them were that big, but, right. you know, but you know, they get paid right there on the spot, mm-hmm. showing up in uh, uh, in uh, sweats and uh, flip flops. Right, <laughs> you and know? they're just like, I'm at work, uh, yeah. about to yeah. broker a deal. <laughs> yeah, all I'm doing here is smoking weed, playing some beats for these right. people, get walk out with a check. And mm. I was like, I want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's the job for me. <laughs> and the thing is, during this time, I'd always been like working on, you know, mm. my own producing, my own music, working mm. on my own beats and stuff like that. So, mm. um. I went into what's it called? Like so, I was like, you know, what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that. Okay. You know? And the thing is, during this entire time, like I had also been working like a full time, you know, day job. Okay. And um, eventually, I ended up working. I cut down my hours, and I said, you know, I'm gonna work part time and mm. focus more on, you know, your music. Um, focus more on my music and stuff like that. And, you know, I would say I had some relative success with that, but I also kind of focused on something a little bit different, too. Yes, I worked with artists, but I also okay. focused more on trying to license music to um, ah. uh, what's it called for like TV, music and film, because one thing I think a lot of like music producers or anybody that's looking to get into music mm-hmm. is usually just solely thinking about, uh, you know, you know, I guess selling their music to a certain extent, even though that's right. still a really rough thing and hard thing to do nowadays. I'm sure I was going to say, like, you made it sound like it's easy <laughs> for know? them to. Yeah. But it's hard. like a lot of people, you know, yeah. produce and do beats. I'm sure there's many of you yeah. out there yeah. who do so. And yeah. I mean, it's difficult. Yeah. A lot of a lot of people who are in it know the hustle. Um, and then I was just like, you know, or if you're an artist, you're thinking about, like, you know, selling merch and touring and that's how you make your money. But, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, but I wasn't an artist. Uh, so but I think mm-hmm. the lane that I think a lot of people sort of overlook mm-hmm. is is that licensing. And the truth of the matter is about licensing that I think a lot of people don't realize, like, mm-hmm. yes, you want to make good quality music. Right. But the type of music that gets licensed for stuff isn't necessarily the stuff you always hear on the radio or the right. best stuff that, or the best stuff that's like the hottest thing that's going on right, right. now. Mm-hmm. A lot of stuff that gets licensed. I mean, so even some big producers will tell you, like, mm-hmm. hey, I licensed stuff that was like, you know, some stuff that was just shelved, you know, wow. some stuff stuff that I thought was cheesy, horrible, whatever, but it works for this particular product or it works for this particular commercial and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for me, I never, I'll be full disclosure for anybody who's listening out there. Like (laughs) I never made a ton of money doing this. So (laughs) so, like, I'm not trying to sit out here that say that I was uber successful at this, but you you know, um, I licensed like a couple songs for, for TV shows. It it ended up getting me a couple of cheeseburgers, (laughs) 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 you know, (laughs) so like not all licenses are built the same or anything like that, just because there's don't get me wrong like i was very excited when i got my you know 30 dollar check in the mail (laughs) right right (laughs) you know um but uh but that's good because it's like you you loved what you were doing yeah so you continue to do it despite the fact that at the at that time you hadn't gotten to the level that you wanted to to be at yeah 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 but Mm -hmm. um but ultimately like you know i would say that like i learned a lot i learned a lot i knew a lot business-wise because i also in in Mm -hmm. conjunction to going to school for audio engineering Mm -hmm. like i also got a entertainment business degree along with Mm -hmm. it too okay so that's another reason why like i kind of knew not to put all my eggs sort of all in one One basket one basket in terms Mm -hmm. of like trying to create multiple revenue streams for myself as a producer seeing like all the ways that i could possibly make money off of the music that i was making that's awesome so you had the licensing, which yeah. you learned how to do that. And yeah. so you were a value add there. Yeah. And then you knew how to produce mm-hmm. and you knew how to write music. Mm-hmm. And so you all these different avenues you were you were gaining mm-hmm. basically revenue from. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cause there was like because I essentially I essentially had like three revenue streams when okay. I was working in music. Uh, at least post, you know, working at uh at uh Jim Jones's studio. So mm-hmm. like I had the uh what's it called I was A, I was still trying to seek out artists that I really wanted to work with. And that was something okay. that I really wanted to make sure of to only work with artists that I really felt strongly about. And I actually mm-hmm. did produce like an EP with uh with a uh R and B singer. Oh awesome. uh, I'll be honest with you, like in hindsight, like, you know, I think you always feel like you could do better and whatnot. But at okay. the time but you know, but I'm not ashamed of that body of work. Okay. Like that. I'm not, try- I'm not <laughs> Is trying Is there anyone say- we know? Um not really. Not really okay. <laughs> <laughs> not really, not really, but um, but you know, wherever she's at, I hope she's doing well. Okay. Um, uh, but I had that was you know trying to work angles with that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, I was trying to sell 
you know, beats and instrumentals to artists. So there was another revenue stream there. Mm -hmm. And then obviously, and then the licensing. So those were really the three avenues that I was trying to pursue. And I did that for about two years before pivoting to podcasts. Okay, that's so. So for those of you out there who are interested in getting into producing, right? There are multiple ways of, of making money. And then now cut to the digital age yeah. <laughs> right, where everything is there's like i'm sure there's even even more ways to have yeah there's a lot more income. yeah there's a lot more opportunities now i think it's um don't get me wrong like there's a lot of comp don't get me wrong like it's a lot of competition it's right. still very hard mm. but i would say because of like you know i mean not to say that i didn't have like smartphones and all these other avenues too right. for me but even more so now there's so many ways to be able to promote and get your okay. name out there so mm. you know you don't have to be as reliant on you know other people in order to be able to get your name out there so right okay cool so let's dig in a little bit deeper on the licensing mm. that you were doing at this at the at this particular studio how exactly did you go about that? Um, so, well, I wasn't really doing it at any particular studio. It was really like, you know, mm. I would mean, it was at my home studio. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but like the licensing that I was doing in terms of licensing my own music, mm-hmm. I mean, there was lots of different sorts of like deals and contracts that were going along with mm-hmm. that. And this is like where like I, some of like the... Um, uh, entertainment business sort of knowledge that I had um, oh, right. kind of came into play. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, from the degree I got from Full Sail, but um, which I know some people from Full Sail is just like oh, I didn't really use that degree at all. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you did. Yeah, but I did. But I but I did a little bit. Uh-huh. Um, I think the the. I'll kind of give you like my thinking about it. So like mm-hmm. whenever I finished a track, right, mm-hmm. um, I would kind of assess like its viability in terms of like how licenses, how if licensability is a word, right, how, you, right. know, you know, how licensable this track is. Um, and where do I see it? Like you have to kind of like, once you finish it, where do you envision it being, you know, Mm. being, is it something that you think could be in an advertisement? Do you think it's something that could fit in a particular movie scene? Um, is it something that you could, that could fit in, um, you know, as something that's in a TV show or something like that. These are all sorts of things that I would try to assess once I finished a track. I tried not to create tracks, um, based on a particular scene or anything like that. But every once in a while, I would get um, these things that were, we'll just call them, I think they were called briefs from different like uh, music supervisors. And for people out there who aren't familiar with the music supervisors, these are people who um, end up being, these are the people that are in charge of choosing the music for the things that we hear in TVs, commercial films and stuff like that. So that's a job. (laughs) That's a a career. It's a pretty cool job. I'm not going to lie. Like if, if there was another career path, you know, the, that might have been it too. Wow, um, wow. It's not too late. Yeah. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so essentially it's yeah. like you're like being a DJ for, you know, for, for movies and film. film and stuff like wow. that. So it's pretty mm-hmm. cool. Um but they would get these I would say I would get these briefs and they would say like they're looking for music in mm-hmm. this style, you know, they tell you the genre. They usually give you like a reference track, okay. you know, usually something relatively popular. Like sound a little something like, like this. this. Okay. Yeah, they, they, they'd be pretty explicit about like what or pretty specific about like what they were looking for and okay. stuff like that. So mm-hmm. you're trying to sort of hopefully you have a track in your catalog or something that you could make in time mm-hmm. for whenever that needed to be submitted. But in terms of like the deals, so like if you were being considered for it, mm-hmm. um, you know, if they ended up choosing your track or even just, you know, in the, you're in the running or something like that, they would kind of send you like, you know, mm-hmm. a template sort of contract um, for that. And okay. sometimes it would be things like a, a work for hire and, um, you know, and so, again, so yeah. what is so. OK, so work for hire is an agreement that basically allows you to decide who's going to own what as mm-hmm. part of this relationship. Yeah. So how did you guys sort of work that out? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, a lot of times, I'll be honest with you, as a as a producer that that is not well known, and, <laughs> right? And at the time, couldn't really afford lawyers or anything like that. Like, you don't really have a lot of leverage in terms of gotcha. ne- in terms of negotiating uh, too many things, depending on who who you're dealing with. I mean, sometimes okay. you could. I'm okay. not going to say like I never did or anything right, right. like that. But um, you know, if uh, the person, if the client, if the bit, if the end client is Coca Cola, for example, right. like, there's not <laughs> this really, is the agreement. <laughs> this is the, this is the agreement, right. and you're going to sign this right. if, you, if you if you want to get this money so mm-hmm. um and i'll just add there it's because if they're you know sort of paying for for whatever it is the product mm-hmm. the music the 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 audio they want to make sure that they're free to use it however they want mm-hmm. and so that goes into why you need to have that paperwork in place for them on the business side and for you as the artist you you know you're dealing with your leverage <laughs> your, your power and your authority 
um, within the market. So mm -hmm. you, you do what you got to do. Exa mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And like, um, and, and just to be like, sort of like even more specific about it, like, and mm -hmm. I'm, not in every case, but a lot of the work for higher cases, you know, mm -hmm. um, and thing is like, I would also sometimes get them for work that I engineered too, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Okay. So it's like, it, it's really about how they, it's really kind of depends upon like, they're pretty much saying, are we going to pay you not all the time. Are we paying you in royalties or, or are we paying you as a lump sum? And typically, if it's a work for hire, they're just going to pay you a lump sum that the two that you and them agree upon. So, right. And what I will say is, like, usually when you're doing a work for hire sort of situation, like, yes, the lump sum um, can be very enticing. Mm -hmm. um, and to be, honest, to be honest, most of the time I took it because like, I didn't really feel like, you know, they're really, I, sometimes you're going to know there's really not going to be a ton of royalties. Or anything right, right. So depending would, on what it's being so used for. for depending, depending, yeah, yeah, depending on what it's being used for, you know there's really... <laughs> <laughs> you know that it's uh, not going to be, uh, mm -hmm. you, you know, you're not going to really see a lot of back-end royalties for that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but... I think what it is is once you complete a piece of music and you mm -hmm. assess what it can be used for and, mm -hmm. and kind of like how good it is too. Right, right. Um, if you know you have a, a, a track in, and even if you're not even talking about licensing for ads, for example, right? Okay. Which is even different between licensing to a uh, to an artist, right? Okay. And mm -hmm. this is like somebody where you're not really directly involved with the artist. Like, for example, there are websites out there like BeatStars, which is a very popular website, and, okay. and others too, where you see a whole bunch of producers will have like their, you know, their beats on their there. Beats, their beats on there. Okay. And then you can, the person who is the artist can go on there and choose, or just someone who's looking for music can go in there and choose the level of quote unquote like ownership, quality. quality and ownership mm, of, okay. of, uh, oh, sorry, of that track. Now, if you have a really good track that you believe could potentially be a hit, mm -hmm. you know, um, you're gonna ask for royalties on something like you're that. You're gonna ask for royalties or something like that, or for example, like if uh, the like it's called the most expensive thing that usually you can buy on a website like mm -hmm. that is the you buy the exclusive rights. Mm, so if right. you buy the exclusive rights, usually that means the person is buying that beat from you or that track from you outright, and then you don't own it anymore. Anymore, but right. usually, like you know, that's a smart business person would do and obviously you're going to put a very high premium on that because at that point in time right. that means that you no longer own that track mm -hmm. and um at that point you can't license it anymore and the benefit of being able to license it do something that you continue to own right. is that like you can as long as you're not giving away all the rights to it mm -hmm. like even though you might only get like maybe someone wants to license it for 25 dollars for you mm -hmm. know you still own you that. still own it you so still you can keep reusing it. it yeah Meaning Resell like thousands, it, yeah, mm. thousands of people could could buy your twenty five dollar yeah know, license. license, you know, for you know theoretically forever. Yeah, you know, so that's the reason why if you're going to do the exclusive route, or if mm. someone's going to buy, or if you're going to put a price on the exclusive, you got to make sure that it's a, a high dollar amount. That that's that's super dope because mm. um, so now you see when you protect what you've created, mm -hmm. <laughs> and you are able to sort of like exploit it. There's a lot of money there, so you can license it, you can sell it, you could sell it to somebody for exclusive use. But you know that if you're selling and you're you know giving away all your rights to it, that there's a higher value there, just mm. like you know Josh really said. So all that has to be accounted for when you're negotiating these type of deals, these yeah. type of transactions, because you want to make sure that you're adequately being compensated for what you're what you're creating. Yeah, hundred mm. percent. Yeah. So what made you pivot? To podcasting? Um, the short answer is I wasn't making any money. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I did it like one thing I will say is like I did all these steps like as I because I kind of pivoted multiple times okay. like in a, like in a very like in on all of this is within the last like maybe six or seven years I pivoted okay. multiple times and but I always kind of did it a little bit strategically like you know when I decided to work part time and then eventually I stopped working part time I saved up money to in order to do all of these things okay um so like I was never when I say like yeah like I wasn't making any money but I literally saved money um from working full time and part time mm -hmm. you know I was still tucking away lots and lots of money so that like when i knew when there were times where i wasn't making a paycheck or getting any money right you know i wasn't missing out on rent or anything like that you know gotcha. i lived a very very frugal lifestyle i still do <laughs> to, to, <laughs> okay. uh, what's it called to a very large extent but um uh but yeah like i made all these things made all these moves strategically um and what made me pivot to podcast was like i wasn't making any money and to, but the bigger thing was like mm -hmm. my relationship to me making music was not as what I thought it would be uh, after a while. Like, okay. you know, um, 
you know, I'd gotten a lot better as a producer. Um, I gotten a lot better as an engineer, but like, it wasn't as rewarding for me as it was when I, when I, it was one thing when you were doing it just for fun, right, and, you know, and right. a lot of people tell you this too, you know, yeah. when you, when you make your passion, the thing that, um, uh, that's earns what, a living. that earns a living, <laughs> you know, it really does change your relationship with it. Mm-hmm. And it's not that I really began to hate it or anything like that, but mm-hmm. it was just because, uh, you know, I was actually liking the stuff that I was making, but I also was realizing the stuff that I wanted to make wasn't necessarily the most, uh, commercially viable stuff. Oh, I understand. <laughs> you, know, yeah. if, you know, I realized that I had a very niche sort of sound mm-hmm. um, and it wasn't something that, you know, especially considering I, I was uh, really focused on where like the big dollars were for the licensing and stuff like mm-hmm, that. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, they always want very happy cheer, like especially if, like advertisements are where the, some of the, the biggest paydays are. Okay. And there were some times where I was like, you know, you're competing with a lot of people and like I knew I was like, oh, my song is a finalist for something that right. could pay me $10,000 and knowing that you lost out to the one other person that was <laughs> <laughs> right, right. being considered so wow. like that, that, mm-hmm. that stuff you know having moments like that made you feel good in the moment you're like hey you know i got good i got you know my tracks are good enough for, right. for, for you know for uh someone to want to pay me this sort of money but also at the same time but when you don't get that opportunity you're mm-hmm. like you know you know it's kind of like a catch-22 but um yeah so you felt like um you fell out of love with it did you feel like the time was wasted or did you feel like it was good to be able to discover Mm-hmm. Um, hmm, that's a good question. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't really believe any time is ever wasted because there's right. a lot that I, I mean, there's that saying, you learn a lot more from your losses than your wins. And, yeah, well, and let me tell you something for anybody who's listening, I lost a lot. Okay. <laughs> I took a lot of L's. Mm, okay. <laughs> um, and, um, I definitely don't think it was wasted because, mm. Well, I would say a lot of the things that I learned business wise in terms mm. of time management, mm. uh, for myself, mm. uh, and it was also just in terms of just like general business practices, um, uh, how to work efficiently, mm-hmm, right. <laughs> you know, um, and uh, a lesson that I'm still learning is how to put a team around you and stuff like that. OK. You know, I think a lot of those a lot of those things I learned the hard way. But, I, you know, and, but I've nonetheless. Uh, nonetheless. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I feel you on that because like even things that I I wish that I had made better decisions about or had done in a different way. Mm. It, there's always times where I'm I may be going through something, you know, present and I'm like, oh, I see how that piece of information comes full circle. Mm-hmm. And so I, I agree. I don't think there's anything that's, you know, ever lost. Whatever reason that that was your path, mm-hmm. that was your path. And yeah. I'm sure it will all tie. It it, it has tied in, but all yeah. will will continue to tie in. Yeah. So tell me about um your your now your transition to podcasting and what's your, what's your relationship with that now? <laughs> so like I've been doing, I guess you could say I've been in the podcast world for about five years now, going on maybe five and a half okay. years now. Mm-hmm. Um, so how that really came about was literally. Um, I had had like a talk with my, what's it called? I had a talk with at the time my then fiance now wife. Mm-hmm. I, I it's called I had a talk with her because um. One of the things, because like, you know, I think we knew that we were eventually going to get married and we were okay. trying to move together and stuff like that in terms right. of like both of our career paths and stuff like that. Um, and and I told her like when I quit my job, when I even quit the part time job, mm-hmm. I was like, look, I'm going to give myself a year to try to figure this thing out. OK. And, you know. I wouldn't say I didn't figure it out, but I figured out like, you know, what, you know, whether I'm going to continue with this or not. And mm-hmm, I decided mm-hmm. and, you know, and I decided not in the same capacity, like, or this is just not, this isn't working clearly. Right. Um, so I was literally on the train one day and I was listening to a podcast and I don't remember what podcast it was, but I just kind of had a, le- like a legit epiphany. Really? And I was just like, I know how to make one of these. Mm. I know exactly what goes into making one of these Mm. because I've been working essentially, I've been working with audio since I was a teenager at this point. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Like Mm. I've been editing audio like damn near my entire life. Wow. And all, and it's called, and even though like I'd only been working on it in a music capacity, audio is still audio. Right. That, that, that that really doesn't change. Like all the same skill sets that, all the same skills that you need in order to edit audio and music. Mm -hmm. Pretty much all tra- all translate or cross over into what you need to do for podcasting, and okay. in many ways, if you've been working in music for a while, like it's 
the secret is it's a lot easier. <laughs> it's <laughs> That's a, good. That's it's good. actually a lot easier. Don't get me wrong. There, there are instances where like uh, like scripted podcasts, for example, where you're mm-hmm. going to add like music and sound effects and all these things to make it sort of like theater of the mind. Mm-hmm. Like those kind of stuff is is just as challenging as putting putting together a music track and okay. stuff like that. Okay. But sort of like but the difference between I would say the degree of difficulty between, uh, you know, uh, creating a finished uh, music track versus mm-hmm. you know uh, a podcast episode. Oh no, yeah, ways. Way I mean, like the, yeah, I mean, like I could spend I could spend a whole week on a track, wow. you know, weeks on one track. You know, for a podcast episode, I'm done in 20 minutes. You know? <laughs> <laughs> look at that, look at that, and that goes back to what yeah. we were saying. How like you never know how your skills will translate into yeah. the next thing, and you're like, oh shoot, all of these things apply here. Yeah, you know, I'm already good at this, so mm-hmm. that. That's good. Never taking anything for granted. Yeah. Uh-huh. I think the hard part was just, um, or the, <laughs> the part with, that was uh, a little bit of a leap of faith, but a what mm-hmm. I would say was a relatively easy leap of faith mm-hmm. in a way, mm-hmm. was just the fact of like, I had, I was like, I know that I can create these things. Right. But now that I'm thinking about seeking employment in this area, I need to be able to convince somebody that, hey, I can do this right. very, very well. Very well. <laughs> <laughs> like, I know I can do this very, very well, even mm-hmm. though I've never done it before. Mm. And um, so how it happened was I, you know, oddly enough, Craigslist has actually gotten me just about every single job <laughs> that, <laughs> really? so that I've ever gotten, which is, which is really Do you guys cr- even know what Craigslist <laughs> I know, is? I know. <laughs> Shout out to Craigslist. Craigslist has been like a, a really big savior for me in life. And and I don't know why it's been so pivotal. Right. But You're like, one of those people yeah. who it just works for. Yeah. Yeah. You know, even me and initially meeting my initial business partner for mm. this place happened through uh, Craigslist as well. Wow. Actually. wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, but um, essentially, uh, essentially uh, uh, what happened was. From your epiphany. Uh, yeah. From, yeah. yeah I to go. From my epiphany. And thank you. Because mm-hmm. I was losing my train of thought there. Um I was on Craigslist and I found I was looking for job listings for specifically for podcasting mm-hmm. and I saw an ad in a, a, a what's it called a relatively big podcast called The Human Experience mm-hmm. that I'm not sure if it's actually still going on right now. Okay, but um, they what's it called the host of the show was looking for a um, he was looking for a brand new editor slash producer and I okay. was like okay, um. And so I reached out to him and sent him my resume and he's just like, uh, well, your resume sounds impressive, but you've never done podcasting before. Mm. And he's just like, you know, but I'm going to ask you to submit a demo with like a bunch of other people and, you know, whoever submits the best demo to me wins. And Mm. pretty much what we had to do was repurpose like three uh, already existing episodes of his um, and kind of put them. Yeah. (laughs) And I was like, I was just like, and kind of make like a best of sort of thing. Uh. So I was just like, you know what? I'm going to show this guy everything that I can do. Mm-hmm. Like it was kind of like the demo. I'm not going to lie. It was very extra. Okay. <laughs> like, like it was. You was like, I'm going to shoot my shot. Not, yeah. I got one shot. I'm not going to blow it. Yeah. So. Yeah. So I was like, you know, what? I'm going to show him everything that I can do. Okay. And then, you know, he's like, you know, and then he chose mine out of like 50 other applicants. That's dope. Yeah. And yeah. I was just like, and he was just like, yeah, everybody else kind of gave me the same thing. You gave me something really different. And mm. granted, he's like, I don't need you to do all those things. <laughs> right. <laughs> he's just, but. <laughs> but he's like, but knowing that you can do all of those things means mm. like I, you know, opens up, gave me ideas for future episodes and stuff like right. that. So, um, so we worked together for, um. Uh, the, the host of the show is you know, who I was working for. His name is Xavier Katana. Okay, and uh, I ended up working with him for um, about two years. And okay. like you know, and his podcast was you know his podcast was big, but we even uh, even helped him grow a little bit more. The production okay. value definitely stepped up. Got um, it. You got know, it. and I say that with all the humble <laughs> humility. Yeah, you know, all the humility. Exactly, yeah, he- He's definitely very humble. Yeah, yeah. So, mm. and, yeah, because like the one thing I noticed too, I was like, yeah, we can improve X, Y, and Z. You know, mm. we should be doing, you know, um, uh, you know, I kind of, you know, gave him some ideas in terms of like, we can do ads and like, you know, what we should put in them. So mm-hmm. I wrote some copy for those sorts of things. Okay. You know, we got some, I told him like, yeah, we should get some testimonials because we had a, we had a pretty big following, like okay. just, just to give us some context. And to me, like numbers aren't everything, mm-hmm. but like we had a very, very large community. Like I'd probably nice. say on the low end, we averaged around maybe, uh, uh, 12,000 listens per episode, oh, that's uh, you know, good. in a given mm-hmm. like over like maybe a week or two. Mm-hmm. And then on the high end, we could have 80,000. So like just depended on the guests. And we, right, had some, right. we had some high profile guests, um, like some, I would say like they're n- none of them are like super duper, like, you know, like celebrities or anything like right. that. But, um, but they're all like very well-known experts in their field. Like a lot okay. of people, some of these people have been like featured.
featured on Joe Rogan and stuff like that. So okay, like, okay. So if if pe- followers of the podcast yes, knew, knew who, who was who, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's dope. Yeah. So I I did. So you you about. mentioned something about um writing copy and things like that, and I know you're very good with sort of like words and yeah. kind of like <laughs> saying things in such a way to like to like get the audience's attention. How how did you build that skill set? Um. I probably have to say first and foremost, mm. I'd have to thank like my freshman year like English teacher. <laughs> <laughs> um, Shout out to the English teacher. Yeah, who was a huge pain in the ass. But I was always a good. I was always a good. I was always a good writer. Mm. And um, and I kind of I've always like thought in the back of my mind if I didn't go the music route, I probably would have did something like broad like but like a journalist or something. Like okay. That. Mm. Um, so I'd always kind of been good at writing, um, especially after you know. Uh, being taught by that teacher but Mm -hmm. um what i think it is is that like naturally like i like to speak with as much clarity as possible Mm, okay and like i think is like when i listen to people and this might be you know quote unquote you can call it a gift or whatever but like when i hear what's it called when i hear people talk Mm -hmm. what i realize is like uh a lot of people don't know how to express themselves and with a lot of clarity. <laughs> gotcha. Yes, yeah. I've, and, I've experienced that too. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's very. I think it's a very difficult thing to do. And I think I think I struggle with it even speaking wise. You know, yeah. sometimes. But um, uh, I think I naturally had that gift. But I think the other thing is too is when I initially started the studio, mm-hmm. um, the one thing I knew I was not interested in doing was simply recording people. Okay. I was bored of that. I was really, <laughs> I'll be Record. honest with you. I'll be honest with you. I was not, that was not my main interest to wanting to get into podcasting. Like mm-hmm. at least when I was starting the studio, like I wanted to, to be a space where I could actually try to help people be the best that they could be, mm. you know? And I think part of it was, um, you know, I took some of the things that I learned while, you know, working for the human experience podcast. Okay. Um, but I would probably say a lot of the things that, you know, that, you know, in, in full disclosure, you know, yes, I've, I've helped you and told you some things. Yes. And some critiques and stuff like that. <laughs> He's been coaching me behind the scenes <laughs> with, with, with really good insight, you know, that has helped me. So I feel like I've been growing, you know, mm. as I've been go- going through this podcast and, you know, this podcast is young if you guys have been following. Mm. And so um, you really have a, a, I don't know. It's just like you really have a way with sort of making things like I'll say, OK, this is what I want to talk about. And like he'll flip it and it'll be like, dang, Josh, it's like three seconds you came up with it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm an attorney. So like, <laughs> but go ahead. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it means being able to speak with clarity. And then I would probably say like the two things that like the two things, and, you know, you and you're going to hear me. You've heard me say this to you before. Right. So to you, this is nothing new. Right. But like, you know, for anybody who's looking to to start a podcast out there, if you're mm-hmm. out there, you know, listening to this, watching this, and you're interested in starting a podcast, like speaking with clarity, cl- like you when you're speaking, uh, whatever you're doing, whatever you're trying to express, you have to you have to express it with clarity, but then mm-hmm. it also has to be compelling. Those mm-hmm. are like the two things. If you are able to to uh, effectively communicate doing those two things, right. um, you should have a good product. Like, li- like literally, right. like that's really what it comes down to. Um, because a lot of people either fail at one of those two things or fail at both of those things. Okay. You know, and a lot of it is how you, f- I mean, it's, uh, there's a lot of people that have like very interesting things to say, very like, and they have great voices, you know, mm-hmm. that's, mm-hmm. that's the thing that I think that I find, you know, I- I'm so compelled to help people with this because <laughs> like, I find it frustrating when I see somebody that has, I know something really like really great information or something right. really good to say mm. um, uh, or and it, and people really need to hear this, mm-hmm. but they can't they can't express it in a way where people will actually tune into them. And that's where I believe right. I that's where I most try to help people um, in that okay. in that department. So, yeah, that's awesome. And and I agree because it's a lot of times people think that they're speaking clearly or they're mm-hmm. communicating clearly. But on the other end, you're like, I'm sorry. what? Yeah. <laughs> so and I deal with that with clients having to explain to me scenarios or what mm-hmm. they want to do. And so I always have to like break it down. Um, but from the creative perspective, it's different, right? Yeah. You want to really sort of, you want to give people what they care about mm-hmm. and how they want to care, how they care about hearing it. So I, I totally um, understand that. So Josh, what are some of the benefits of having a podcast when you already have like your main business, mm-hmm. but you add a podcast on to, I guess, as marketing or yeah, I think, um, I mean, obviously there's many different reasons to start mm-hmm. a podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, 
you know, people do it for personal reasons. It's like a passion project of theirs. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, there's many good reasons, but I would say like from a a business perspective, like if you're, if you're a business owner, Mm -hmm. an entrepreneur out there and like you're quote unquote looking to, I hate saying that we're a build your brand, but (laughs) but it's a real thing. Um, It definitely is a thing. Yeah. Yeah. So um, especially if you are a person who um, you're really like the, you know, the, the face of your company and Mm -hmm. everything like that. Um, You know, I think in today's day and age, especially people who are, you know, a little bit younger, I probably say if like you're under the age of 45, Mm -hmm. there's that term, the, uh, the passion economy is a real thing. And Mm -hmm. people really want to, um, really more so than ever care about where they're spending their money and who they're spending, who they're spending their money on, Mm -hmm. um, so I really believe a podcast can allow for people to get to know you, the person mm-hmm. like behind what you're trying to do, why you're trying to do it. And they get to know you. Mm-hmm. Um, I think all of that helps in terms of uh, in terms of whether or not they will decide to ultimately, you know, buy your products or services. I mean, yeah. I think that's a, I would say that's true for me, like mm-hmm. for the most part, like, you know. I mean, yes, you know, like anybody else, I buy stuff from big names and big <laughs> right. brands and stuff Amazon, like that. Amazon, we're not BFFs yeah, with Bezos. Yeah, I, yeah. Well, Jeff get, manages to get my money all the time. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Damn it, Jeff. Even when I don't want to spend <laughs> no, with no, you. <laughs> no. I try to go out of my way not to give Jeff all my money. But um, <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, is uh, you know, I think all that stuff really matters when it comes to mm-hmm. Um, what's it called? All that stuff really matters when it comes to people, uh, you know, caring about where they're spending their money. Right. And, you know, don't get me wrong. Like, I will tell what's it called. I do believe in, you know, monetizing your podcast. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, like I mentioned earlier, but, um, right. but the truth of the matter is, is like, you know, if you're looking to strictly, if you're looking at podcasting as a, as a purely like a money making venture, mm-hmm. there are a lot better ways <laughs> to make money <laughs> I'll than, be, having uh, a podcast. than having a podcast. <laughs> okay. Like there's a lot better business ventures. A podcast can be a business venture on its own, mm-hmm. but I wouldn't say it's the easiest or fastest way to go about. Right. So <laughs> the people who are it. doing it super successfully, mm-hmm. it's not the norm, right? Yeah, They're yeah. the exception. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They're not, not the norm, but like I will say, I will say that um, in order to at least sort of break even, because I think a lot of people mm-hmm. would just be, would are, are very happy as long as they don't have to come out of pocket right, anymore, right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for their, for their podcast. I think break even is something that is very achievable, but mm-hmm. like, like, uh, but it, like, it, like anything, it, it involves being consistent and takes some time. Right, um, right. But in terms of just like a business, uh, I mean, it's a great marketing tool slash like, what's that term? Like loss leader or whatever, okay. which is really what it, really the same thing is like, it's a marketing tool mm-hmm. um, in order for you to be able to really, in order for people to really get to know, you know, either the ethos of the brand, they get right. to know, you know, what you're doing, why you're doing it. All those things I think are very, very, uh, it can be very, very beneficial, you know. And I think sometimes people, um, you know, uh, when they're starting uh, a podcast for their business, they, you know, really need to make sure that they're honing in on, um, you know, you're doing this for a reason. You have a purpose. And there's nothing wrong with, you know, admitting that, yes, you're doing it because you're looking to Mm -hmm. either attract new clients Mm -hmm. or you're trying or for the people that already kind of know you, but maybe haven't purchased your products or services. They're getting your what's called. You're trying to attract them to get them to know you a little bit better, but Mm -hmm. getting to do it in a more genuine way. (laughs) Right. 